Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com. It is a Tuesday night primetime edition and the first episode of the week as PewterReport.com was in Orlando, Florida for the NFL annual meetings where we had conversations with Todd Bowles, Jason Light, the Glazer family as well, Joel Glazer, and a lot of great stuff was extracted from it. So we are going to break it all down as we look at the future of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I know that it's a Tuesday, but don't forget, because it's our first show of the week, we're going to have Roll Call as well. So... A fun, action-packed show today with plenty of video as well. I'm your host, Matt Matera. Joined with me is my colleague from Pewter Report that joined myself and Scott at the NFL annual meeting. It is Adam Sly Slavon. Scott Reynolds will be on tomorrow's show as Scott is an older man and, uh, you know, needs his rest after this trip from Orlando. But anyway, Adam, thanks for joining the show today. What is going on? What's going on, Matt? Now, I don't know about you, but had an absolute blast in Orlando last night and this morning uh, talking to a bunch of various bucks, and it was a yeah. great opportunity. It was a great event and had great weather, too, last night uh, outside for that little party going on. But, man, there's a lot to get into, whether it's Todd Bowles, Jason Light, Joel Glazer. There's so much to get into. There is. And yeah, one of the one of the fun perks of the annual meeting used to be called the owners meeting is um, there is they call it a dinner, but it's kind of like a big party for everyone that's going the coaches, the owners, um, media as well. So met some cool people last night, said hello to some people that we've met before. Not going to name drop everybody, but like someone we can mention because he's not even an NFL guy. Vince Carter, the NBA legend, was there. Had a great conversation with Vince. He is a huge Bucks fan as well. He's from Florida. And um, actually, some of you guys may remember, Vince Carter went to a either a training camp practice or a practice early in the season for the Bucks in 2018 with Jameis and Ryan Fitzpatrick and uh, was out there. So chatted some Bucks with Vince Carter. Um, He's going to try to get to training camp this year. Um, which will be fun. Speaking of Ryan Fitzpatrick, had a fantastic conversation with him as well. So uh, those are just some of the names, and there were some big, big names and that we uh, spoke to. Andrew Whitworth was very cool as well. So um, yeah, awesome time there, and food and drink was fantastic, Adam. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's get into it with, uh, first of all, shout out to all the Peter people that are uh, – in the chats right now i understand it's a prime time show different timing so got to readjust your your calendar and everything but hello to richard taroku says hello matt adam and bucks fans by the way if you guys have any uh any questions things like that feel free to throw it in the comments might get to a couple if you super chat us i can guarantee you we will get to said uh question or statement or whatever may be so without further ado adam uh so that was everything we just talked about was Monday night, right? Yeah, today's Tuesday. Tuesday morning had a very early start to the day, which was nice because we were just up and ready to go. Um, Todd Bowles spoke very, very early in the morning. I want to say around 745. And it's fun because it's while it's a big event, the discussions and conversations with coaches and GMs are – I think way more intimate than say at like the combine or or other events, because it's like a small little round table thing where local media usually sits and then other national media can kind of bop around from place to place to place and everything like that. So it's a nice little way to get involved with everybody, but Todd Bowles had a lot to say, Adam, Um, whether it was, about Baker Mayfield, how Baker can get better, whether it was about certain thoughts of the Bucks going to struggle even after winning the division and re-signing everybody, 
what were some of your biggest takeaways from Todd Bowles and his uh, and his statements from this morning? Just want to say it's such a drastic change hearing him this morning talk for 32 minutes as yeah. opposed to the regular season when you maybe get him for five minutes. So Todd really dived deep into a lot of different players, a lot of different topics, even uh, mentioned the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, in one of his answers. He did. But We'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, talking about the draft, it it was kind of evident that the Bucks need to fill a lot of positions. He mentioned that wide receiver could be an option. Uh, The team needs another running back defensively, offensively, building the trenches. So he gave kind of like some subtle intel into the fact that they really need to address those positions. Mm -hmm. And then also going with that, he talked about Liam Cohen and some of the new coaches that are on the staff and how they are helping in the draft prep. I thought that was really interesting. And mentioning Liam Cohen, he said that, he has to uh, get players bathroom breaks because they can't leave the office that they're stuck in there watching film. I think that's really good. And it's, it's great in terms of team chemistry. And then also with that, uh, Brian McClendon, the new wide receivers coach, when you look at all the top wide receivers in this year's draft class, whether that's Adani Mitchell, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey, he's kind of coached them all. So you kind of wonder after listening to Todd, after listening to Jason, if wide receiver really is a position to address, and then with that, how do they address the biggest needs on the roster? It's very funny you say that because as I was cutting up some video before, I took a brief break uh, in between going from video to video. But in that break, I didn't just sit back and relax. I actually did a quick mock draft on Pro Football Focus. (laughs) And... um, Spoiler, Jackson Powers Johnson was my first round pick, but my jaw pretty much hit the floor when I got to my second pick and who was on the board, but none other than Keon Coleman, who uh, had a top 30 visit with the Buccaneers, has spoken about what it would be like to play with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. And I immediately had to take it when I saw that Keon Coleman was there. And then the two rounds later, Malachi Corley was still on the board. And I said, <laughs> screw it. Let's get two wide receivers. It's a mock draft. Uh, it's a mock draft anyway. So let's get two wide receivers to um, add into the mix. So I, I'm i starting to think, and kind of by the way that Jason Light was quite vague today and i think todd todd was a little more direct and jason was vague when i feel like typically todd is more vague granted we get him a lot more than jason and jason's a little more direct with like hey we're doing this or i like this this uh position group in the draft they played different roles today and based on todd's comments and jason's vagueness I really would not rule out a wide receiver in the first round. And again, it's a little dicey with the first round pick because you want a player that is, is going to participate a lot. Right. And when you think, Oh wow. First round, they went with a pick where you already have check step chart. Mike Evans and Chris Godwin doesn't totally make a lot of sense. But then you go back to the fact that, um, Liam Cohen, the new offensive coordinator, is probably going to use a lot more three wide receiver sets. So then the Bucs really need to figure out who is uh, going to be wide receiver three. And sure, Trey Palmer's fun. He's a he's a nice piece. And that can be built upon. If you're going to play a lot of three wide receiver sets, then you can get away with drafting a wide receiver in the first round. So... I think it makes it that much more interesting because let's face it, wide receiver is a super fun position in general. Yeah. <laughs> and if it comes down to interior offensive lineman or a wide receiver, it's not an easy decision to make, but it, I, I think it's a fun one when you could get another skill position player in here. And we've seen in the past, at least the past couple of drafts, the Bucks haven't necessarily gone that way. So it'd be um, a nice little mix, I would say. And uh, let's get to the video of Todd Bowles talking about Trey Palmer and and the uh, the aspect of 
maybe taking another one. Hopeful. I mean, Trey, Trey did a great job last year coming in. He can only get better with the year under his belt. Um, we're still looking at a spot. We think we need another receiver. I'd like Brock Kim to have a full year, uh, not being injured, to see where he really is right now. I think we got some guys on the practice squad that can help as, as well. So we never look away from drafting a receiver. We think there's a lot of them in the draft. So if the timing is right, you know, we'll try to add to it. And um, we'll talk about – actually, yeah, let's get to this other video. Uh, Todd, off the bat, was kind of asked about the value of the experience that the young players got with this semi-deep playoff run. I guess second round is kind of a, a deep playoff run. And if they can kind of build that momentum going into this year – and this was his response. When you look at how you guys finished, the four and seven start was rough, but how you finished, do you feel like like you built some momentum heading into the next season with the playoff experience that your young guys got, bringing everybody back together? I think the young guys got experience for how long the season is and the ups and downs. I don't think we're carrying the momentum into next year because we have a different team. We have some new guys. We have to start over. We have new coordinators on the offensive side of the ball. So we the culture and the chemistry, but we do have guys that have played in tough games and have fought through some injuries and have came out on the other side and see the length of the season. So the young guys being a year older have a lot more confidence. So that's helpful. I agree with what Todd Bowles actually said about everything. Um, yeah. With the young player experience, but I also agree, like, the seasons are so far apart. It's like, how much momentum are you still really feeling after a loss to the Lions in the divisional round when you have opening day of the NFL season in like the second or third week of September? Like, does Jordan Whitehead give a damn that the Bucs lost to the Lions in the divisional round? He was probably thankful. He's probably riding momentum that he's just not on the Jets anymore and is in a, yeah. you know, in a way better situation. So, I don't know. It's kind of like, well, we went to the Combine. Am I still riding the momentum from the NFL Combine in terms of, like, having a fun experience? It's a great memory. I enjoyed it. But so much has happened since the Combine. For example, free agency, which right. makes the next time we meet with Todd Bowles and Jason Light very different. I don't know if I'm riding the momentum from the NFL Combine to go to the NFL owners meeting. And that's a month apart, month and a half apart. From when the Bucks last played in mid-January to September, that's, I don't know the math, but that's at least, you know, that, that's nine months right there. Yeah, so, and when you look at it, like, week to week, like, in the football season, you can see why teams get momentum. They get hot, they get cold, because it's such a short span in between game and game. But when you are in the off season, it's, like, it's hard to build that momentum. And... What what I will say, though, for the Bucks, it's so valuable getting that playoff experience when there's so many young players on the roster, which is kind of what Todd Bowles was alluding to. Last season, yeah. the Bucks had 15 players, 15 rookies, play at least one game and get some meaningful reps. And when you have only three players right now under contract over age 30, mm -hmm. like there's so much opportunity for this team to really grow together. And kind of mentioning it before with Liam Cohen, like building that chemistry, like being more cohesive, even compared to last year, when you when you look at it with so many different moving parts, I feel like the whole staff, like the coaching staff got a lot younger as well. So there's a lot of potential there. So much potential. I think it's a really good point to make. And we got a really great commenter uh, with the $5 Super Chat. Thank you to Meets McGee, one of our favorite fans, uh, yeah. one of our favorite pewter people, I guess we'll say. Uh, thanks, Mr. McGee, for the $5 Super Chat, who says, Matty Diamonds and Sly, do you have a feel that the Bucks board could be one, Jared Verse, two, Jackson Powers Johnson, three, Graham Barton, um, or four, Keon Coleman and dig the Superman curl? Thank you. Uh, yeah, didn't. Hair was good earlier this morning, but I, I didn't fix it before the show. But thanks anyway. Do I feel that's the Bucks one through four? 
I can tell you two and three um, are certainly, I think, in in the right type of position. And I think they're all hoping that JPJ is is there. Beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. I, I don't have a total grasp on how they feel about Jared Verse, but I yeah. obviously they're fans of Keon Coleman. And I think you also got to factor in, like, who do they think will drop? Who do they think can still be there that they want to put on the board? And in the first, like, Marvin Harrison Jr. would probably be number one on their board at wide receiver, <laughs> but he's not going to be there mm-hmm. at, uh, you know, when the Bucks pick later on. The edge rusher thing is tough because I'm a big fan of Jared Verse. And Verse, I think, is another one that I don't think is necessarily going to be there when they are picking. Now, you still come up with that board because I think if Verse is around when the Bucks are on the clock, you take Jared Verse. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I would say, like, I pretty much agree with this big board because the value in finding an elite edge rusher in Jared Verse it's so valuable. And I know we, we kind of talked about this on the last show about having that trend setter, whether it's on offense or defense, like the top two guys there, Jared Verse and Jackson Powers Johnson, they would transform their respective uh, lines, like, and just bring that physicality, that toughness. And with Jackson Powers Johnson, he'd really improve that running game, you know, that ranked yes. last that's kind of been struggling. And then you look at Jared Verse, he would add, more pass rushing prowess to a unit that really needs it after Shaq Barrett's gone. So I would say right now you could probably get an edge rusher. If that top guy's there, maybe get an offensive lineman in the second or third round. Yeah. One of those wide receivers that falls, like you mentioned, uh, Malachi Corley, if he fell in the fourth round in your mock draft, who knows? I think the positions are correct. Yeah. But I think after verse, the, after, after verse, the desire for the pass rushers that are remaining are much, much lower than the availability of the centers and guards that the Bucks also need to address on their roster or at least to find a starter, if that makes sense. It's kind of like mm-hmm. Jared Verse or Bust at edge rusher yeah. where everything else is like, okay, we can find this guy, this guy, that guy. Let's say at wide receiver as well for um, for pretty much everything – that you just said. The next thing that we are going to say is that it is time for some roll call. That's right. Every first show of the week, because today is not Monday. It is a Tuesday. We typically do it on Monday, but we want to know where are you at? Where are you at? Pewter people. For those that might be new to the show or tuning in for the first time or Tune in because the show's later. It's typically a four o'clock, but tonight it's at seven because we were traveling back from, from Orlando, Florida. We do this every week because we love interacting with the Peter people. Um, so on the first show of every week, if you guys want to start putting in your location of where you are watching the show from, I'm going to go on a little conversation about your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And in the meantime, Adam is going to put everyone's location up on the screen and then we'll give a shout out to uh, a couple people specifically after so adam feel free to start uh getting to the comments and i will start this off actually with another video from todd bowles and then kind of uh marinate on that a little bit more so bowles another thing he was asked today and this is a conversation that we've talked about a little bit is um, the lack of respect for the Buccaneers or the disrespect still that the Bucs are getting, even though they've made the playoffs four years in a row, and even though they've made the playoff, or the, they've won the division for the last three seasons. So Todd Bowles was asked about the lack of respect that this Bucs team continues to get, and he made a great reference to it. No difference. Talk about respect. Aretha Franklin is probably the only one that gets it. <laughs> Everybody else can kind of just go with the flow. We're not trying to win the all season. We're trying to win the season. So our focus will be the same. It fuels a lot of us. It fuels a lot of the players. And we get ready to come back and try to defend our title like we did. Just go further. 
R E S P E C T. Find out what it means to me. Or if you're a fan of The Office, you may re- recall when Michael Scott once said R E S P C C. But uh, regardless, again, Todd Bowles can be funny. He makes some yeah. references like that. He's a huge music guy. Shout out to um, Aretha Franklin. Did she pass away? Yeah, a couple of years he, ago. He did. R.I.P. to Aretha Franklin. Um, but to Todd's point, I get it. Kirk Cousins signs with the Falcons, and he's the shiny new toy. He's the next big thing in the NFC South. And I've been on this show before, the Peter Report podcast, for those on audio that may have tuned out and then come back in. I've been on the show before since Kirk Cousins uh, signed with the Atlanta Falcons. And I, I get that the Falcons are a much better team than they were before on, on their own merit and on their own ranking. Yeah. And there was a recent ranking um, after free agency of all 32 teams. And the Falcons were seventh while the Bucs were 21st. And the Bucs had the second-best ranking in the NFC South. And I respect Jared Bailey as a writer. Um, you can find his article on the Touchdown Wire uh, where he made this. And everything with Kirk Cousins, he's a likable guy. He kind of stole Ryan Fitzpatrick's shtick with the putting on chains and things like that. You said it best yesterday that uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick walked so Kirk Cousins yeah, could run. <laughs> he did. He did. But... The, the part, I'll expand upon one part, but the other section that I kind of already talked about and wrote about as well is Kirk Cousins has never had more pressure on him in his career than he does now. And he's already built a reputation as a quarterback that's good when it's Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock or 4 o'clock, more notably 1 o'clock, or I guess noon because they're probably on central time anyway. But when it's... A primetime game, Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night, he doesn't show up. He has one career playoff win. He was never, and his team was never expected to be the favorite when he went to Minnesota. He wasn't even really ever the favorite when he played for Washington. Yeah, It was always Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. It was a nice surprise two seasons ago when Minnesota finally won the division, and it was a big surprise that the Packers didn't. What did the Vikings do? They lost to the Giants and Daniel Jones in the yeah. first round of the playoffs. By the way, remember the Minnesota Miracle, that big play against the Saints, which Bucks fans loved because the Saints choked in dramatic fashion? Kirk Cousins was not the quarterback. It was Case Keenum in that yep. big play. Um, So you got a quarterback that – has never really won big in his career. Finally had expectations last season. Minnesota was the favorite. Yes, the Lions were up and coming as well. So it's kind of a two-team race. And Kirk Cousins got hurt. There's not too much that you can do about that situation. But ultimately, the Vikings did not get the job done in that situation. No, they didn't. But when you talk about Kirk Cousins, I kind of respect that. I maybe like that he's been getting his Coles cash throughout his career and all these big contracts. But when you you mentioned that, that power rankings where the Falcons are seven and the Bucks are 21st last season with the Vikings, although it was short lived. And even the year before that, you know, he had Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, KJ Osborne, PJ Hawkinson. He comes to Atlanta. I mean, there's stars. There's Kyle pitch, Drake London, B. John Robinson, but is that offense really going to be that much better than the Vikings offense? And then you look at the Falcons defense, there's still a lot of holes there. So seeing the Falcons as an early division favorite, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And That's it's a- another case of where the Bucks last season, they were counted out. They were projected two, three wins. It's like, where's yeah. the logic and the respect for the Bucks for winning the division three years in a row, for making the playoffs four years in a row? transitioning to a completely different style of team like it it's baffling well that's how exactly how i feel bucks aside like how much better is this falcons team with kirk cousins than the vikings teams that kirk cousins was on like i mean justin jefferson versus drake london there's no question the answer is justin jefferson and i agree with the defenses as well you know minnesota had their struggles that time on defense but let's not act like the Falcons had a powerhouse style of defense. You know, they still don't really have a 
outside of Justin Bates. It's like, yeah, yeah, like in the secondary, they're pretty solid, but they still don't have a top premier defensive guy that can get after the quarterback or anything like that. The Falcons can be beat. So if you want to say that the Falcons with this Kirk Cousins Falcons is better than the Kirk Cousins Vikings, Maybe only by a little bit, not a crazy, crazy amount. So now all of a sudden, the Bucs who keep all of their guys, who will have continuity, sure, there will be adjustments with Liam Cohen, but it's not going to be as crazy as it was when Dave Canales came in was a first-time play caller. I think that's the most egregious thing, Adam, like you said, is that the, the gap between 7 and 21 separating the Falcons. Yeah. If you want to put the Falcons... I don't know, 11 and put the Bucks 14. I can be okay with that. I can be okay. You can defend that a little bit better. For sure. Um, and, of course, Jason Light was kind of asked about this as well. He got the short and sweet, but quite comical in Jason Light fashion. That's fine with me. I, I like being the uh, underdog. It's, it's, uh, this team likes being the underdog, and uh, um, I like keeping receipts. <laughs> He's been doing that in recent months with the he, receipts, man. He does. Um, I don't have to keep the receipts because I talk about it all the time, and I'm a big fan of it so much. But I like buying. I like enjoying a very nice Celsius energy drink, which is the official energy drink of PewterReport.com. I'm currently drinking an Arctic vibe at the moment because we were up early and had a long drive from Orlando back to Tampa, so to get me through this show for the pewter people. I'm rocking it in Arctic vibe, but don't let that stop you either from checking out the newest flavors of Celsius and their new brand, the Celsius essentials, which are the tall boys of Celsius. They got 270 milligrams and they're uh, bigger in flavor, bigger punch. Adam, you were, you had a Celsius essential this morning, I believe, or yesterday. Yeah. Rocking that mango. It's really good. There you go. Flavors. So whether you're looking for a Celsius essential or maybe the OG, the Arctic vibe, tropical vibe, strawberry lemonade, sparkling watermelon, maybe a cucumber lime, something like that. Any flavor because they are fantastic. Go to the Celsius store locator on the Celsius website. Punch in your address and it'll tell you the closest geographical location where you could pick up a Celsius. It might be a Walmart, maybe a health and fitness store, or if you're lucky enough, you might just stumble upon a local bodega. Bodega. And once you keep going to your bodega, you know, you love Celsius, but you want to get in more, you can get it in bulk. I'd recommend buying the variety pack because variety is the spice of life. And You heard me rattle off all the great flavors of Celsius. So that's when you go to Amazon, click on the subscribe and save, have it sent to your place of residence, whatever you want. You're in charge. You're the captain. Just make sure you're drinking Celsius energy drinks, the official energy drink of the Pewter Report podcast. Now, Matt, you you stopped at uh, one of those magical, mystical bodegas today. I did. I wish I had the video on me, but you can check out our social media, it's on our Twitter and on our Instagram. We stopped by a bodega in Orlando today, and that's actually where I picked up this Arctic Vibe, which I like when I'm done with the can crushing it, so that's why it's, like, <laughs> dented and stuff. It didn't come that way. I I did that on my own. <laughs> um, Super Chats. Meets McGee, back at it again. Thank you to Meets McGee, who says... Ah, my mic's all over the place. He didn't say that. I did. Uh, Meets McGee says, do you believe Jason have a potential trade partner well in advance, just in case their target player falls, enemy territory, Atlanta, I'm in. I don't think there's any trades right now at this moment, unless it's a player for a draft pick, a la Aaron Rodgers, Packers, Jets last season. Um. I don't think there's any trade lined up just yet. At times, trades happen very, very last second. For example, if you guys remember with Tristan Wirfs, the Bucs moved up one spot with the San Francisco 49ers to make sure that they got Tristan Wirfs. 
I don't think, you know, 10 minutes before the draft started, the Bucks were thinking, uh, you had your plan, well, if this happens, then do this. But I don't think the plan all along was to go and trade up one spot to get Tristan Wirfs. It was very, very, very well worth it. Yeah. Um, well but, worth it. Well worth it. There you go. I don't think there's anyone right now that they totally have a, a, a lined up agreement on a trade just yet. That's more reserved for teams that are trading into the top five because they want a quarterback. Those type of things will happen and could happen. I, I doubt it with the number one pick, but there's talks about Washington trading out, New England trading out, even potentially the Cardinals. So it's more for a top five pick. I don't think the Bucs are trading for a top five pick. Now, with that said, they did give themselves some ammunition to go through a trade at some point. It doesn't have to be the first round, but that Carlton Davis trade, getting that extra yep. third round pick, it certainly helps them out because they uh, can maneuver a little bit more than they than they could before the trade. And I thought it was interesting today listening to Jason because you mentioned Tristan Wirfs. The Bucks traded up for him. But they never really trade up. And he said for him, it's resisting the temptation to trade up and get yeah. one of those guys he likes because he doesn't want to sacrifice maybe trading three, four picks to get one guy. However, if maybe pick 20, there's a – a guy there that they really want. Who knows? Maybe they take that third, move up to 20, and grab one of those guys that are on their big board. Yeah, maybe. Shout out to KGH for life with this $2 super chat. Thank you. Who says, what's up with the pass rush? What is up <laughs> with the pass rush? Well, here's where the Bucks stand at the moment. You know, on one side, you're going to have, yeah, yeah. Diaby, an outside linebacker. Now, who's going to be starting on the other side at outside linebacker is still a question. You have Joe Tryon Trianka that started before. You have Anthony Nelson that is very solid as a third string OLB, four string outside linebacker. Then you have some guys waiting in the wings. Cam Gill is still on the team at the moment. I'm not exactly sure why. I think he's kind of plateaued as an edge rusher. You have Marquise Watts, who Adam has written about um, recently and had some flashes here and there. You also have Jose Ramirez, friend of the program, been on the show before. He was on the practice squad all of last season, but the Bucs yeah. brass still enjoy him. There is, of course, a couple of other situations or things that they can look at, such as veteran pass rushers that are still available. I think Jadavion Clowney is out of the Bucks price range, but you yeah. know he's, he is on the market. And then, of course, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, drafting an outside linebacker. So drafting seems like the most logical, viable option. However, there are a couple of things on the board for the Bucks. Yeah, there are. And I, Todd Bowles and Jason Light, they, again, they talked up uh, Marquise Watts and Jose Ramirez today, kind of like they did at the NFL Combine. But it sounds like they're really comfortable rolling with those guys as maybe bubble players on the 53-man roster. But when you look at getting that bona fide guy, if the Bucs don't draft one in the first two rounds, don't really see them getting a veteran pass rusher when you talk about all the youth on the team. That's really the direction that they've been going. Would they trade for Hassan Reddick? Would they sign Jadavian mm -hmm. Clowney? It doesn't make a lot of sense on paper because at that point, why don't you just play Marquis Swats, Jose Ramirez, roll with JTS for one more year, and then really address the position the following year. Yeah. Um, I, the Marquise thing, Marquise Watts thing kind of, uh, I don't know. It, in a way, it, it, it's throwing everything for a loop because he should get an opportunity. But if Jared versus there, you're not going to go, oh, well, Marquise Watts is on the team. We're not going to go draft Jared verse. So, yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a conundrum, but not, you know, not the worst situation to be in. By the way, I wanted to give a shout out to a couple people during uh, roll call today, starting with Richard Taroka, watched from L.A., KGH for Life, who we just had on the screen, from Nyack, New York, AP21, watching from uh, 
Is Minnesota the Great White North, or is that Canada? Mm. Anyway, he's watching from St. Paul, Minnesota. Speaking of Minnesota. Saints, we got people in our backyard. St. P. Florida, Malkior 7. Michael LaRoche, uh, watching from Tampa. Keon High from Dayton, Ohio. And last but not least, Scotty J from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, so probably a big Baker Mayfield fan. So, um, yeah, shout out to everybody participating in roll call today. Another great turnout for sure. Speaking of Baker Mayfield, Todd Bowles answered about what Baker can do a little bit more next season and also talked briefly about Liam Cohen having so much fun, kind of what Adam was talking about before with locking the doors. So here's Todd Bowles on Baker Mayfield and a little bit on Liam Cohen. We're better. Always, always little things. There's still the grasp of the offense. Obviously, from Dave to Liam calling plays, you have to get a better feel, even though they've been together. They haven't been together like this, starting from scratch for a full year. Uh, just take command of the offense and making the adjustments. And he did that last year, but there's still some nuances we can get better at. He'll be the first to tell you that. Some nuances he can get better at to make us more efficient. Uh, would like him to slide a little bit more when he can. Uh, don't want to take away none of his competitiveness, but just commanding the offense and getting us in great positions and putting the ball where it needs to be. Let's continue to do that. He's having the most fun he's ever had coaching. He hasn't even the grasp of the players. Since the offensive of coaching staff yelling so quickly with the guys we kept and the guys that he's brought in, it's been a real joy to see those guys when they go in there and lock the door. I got to get on there and get them guys back from the break. He doesn't let them out of the meeting room. But they have a real good feel for each other, and the chemistry is coming together how you want it. So I look forward to that once the players get in. Thought I guess this is Adam. Let me ask you: When it comes to Baker Mayfield. Can he get much better this season, or is it kind of this is the best that we got with with Baker Mayfield as a Bucks quarterback? You know, that's a great question. And when looking at Baker Mayfield throughout his career, I think one thing that's really like prevented him from being that upper echelon quarterback is really the consistency week yeah. in and week out. Can he be that guy that he was when he played the Packers, when he had the perfect passer rating on the road? Uh, or against the Jaguars when the team is rolling and Baker Mayfield's clicking he's at the when he's at the top of his game there's not many better quarterbacks in the NFL but if he can eliminate those kind of games where when the team was losing six out of seven and he wasn't like being that deciding factor that x factor to get him in the win column that's where it comes into question if he can eliminate a couple of those games I think you can see his numbers go up where statistically speaking He's playing a little bit better. When you look at uh, the outcome of games, maybe the Bucs can pull off two or three more wins. I think that's in the realm of possibility. There is maybe a little bit more. Now, Baker, I don't think he's ever going to be an elite quarterback along yeah. the lines of like Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, but he can settle in and be that top 10 to top 12 quarterback in the NFL. Right now, I'd say he's probably still around the 15 mark, but there, there's just a little bit more I think he can unlock. But at this point, he's also 28. And when you look at it, there's not a lot of time left for him to really improve drastically either. Yeah, I, I agree with, with what you're saying. Because on the one hand, the, the consistency is spot on. And it's funny because I wouldn't say the Bucks necessarily went as Baker Mayfield went. But there are similarities in Baker Mayfield being inconsistent and then the Bucks as a team being inconsistent. Like, remember, they were rolling to begin the season. They went three yeah. and one. But, like, that first game against Minnesota, Baker didn't have a good game. Um, and then they lost six of their, their next seven. And, sure, there were times Baker definitely struggled and was very inconsistent. But he also, like, balled out in that game against the Texans. And then the Bucks won – five of their last six to end the season. But the first two wins of that winning streak, Baker Mayfield had a completion percentage of 44%. Yeah. It was that win against the Falcons and then I think against Carolina or uh, whatever it was. So there were times Baker played great and the Bucs lost and then Baker played terribly and the Bucs would win. Of course, that last game of the season against Carolina as well, where Baker was really banged up. Overall, if Baker 
plays consistently, I think, as you said, the Bucs, um, you know, pick up another win or two along the way and obviously separate themselves from the rest of the pack in the NFC South. How much better can he necessarily get next season, though? I think slightly better. And I say that because you got to look at some of the other quarterback situations that are similar, not totally similar, but in terms of giving quarterbacks big contracts. And there's three that I I really look at and they've had different degrees of like drop off and success and everything like that. But the, the most scary story I would say is Daniel Jones who I mentioned earlier when they beat Kirk Cousins, the New York Giants. Because Daniel Jones had, like, an okay season. Statistically, he had a pretty good season. But the Giants went 9-8-1 and one, or 9-7-1 and one, or whatever it was, got the wild card, and Daniel Jones threw for, like, 3,000 yards and – 15 Please. touchdowns, like yeah. the definition of a game manager. Yeah, and, and five interceptions, which obviously – plays into the game manager like hey he's not turning the ball over and they win they gave him a ridiculous a contract higher than baker mayfield so we're talking about over 100 million i think it was 140 or something like that <coughs> um <coughs> excuse me and then what happened the next year even before he tore his acl the giants were one and five with him he had six the interceptions horrible the, the, the Dan Jones had six interceptions last year. That was more than he had all of the year before. In six games, they went one and five. Now the Giants are thinking about moving on from him one season if they're giving him a $100 million contract. So that's the, you know, the horror story. There are other situations as well, all from that 2022 season. You had Geno Smith who a lot of people compare to Baker of got to revive your career. You're in a new spot. And Gino did quite well, you know, went nine and eight Seahawks made the playoffs was a pro bowler, all that good stuff. Yada, yada, yada. The next season, again, not as drastic as Daniel Jones by any means, but the passing yards went down for Gino. The touchdowns went down from 30 to 20 and the Seahawks went eight and nine and didn't make the playoffs. And again, this is the Seahawks team that has DK Metcalf, who's supposed to be hitting his prime. Jackson Smith and Jigba. I know he got hurt, but played a fair amount. It was very exciting. And, you know, Tyler Lockett, Tyler Lockett is a uh, veteran player that obviously can, can get the job done when asked to. And the other one, and Geno Smith got, I think, a $75 million contract. The yeah. other one, and this is where, again, the – the mega mega contract is is concerning was Jalen Hurts, who obviously was unreal in 2022, got the Eagles to the Super Bowl where they lost in a very close game. The next year, you're thinking, oh, this is a great contract for the Eagles. They started out 10 and 1, but then he got hurt a little bit, played through it, but they went one and seven down the stretch. And then Baker and the Bucks dismantled, decimated, annihilated the Eagles. In the, in the first round of the playoffs. And again, not all because of Jalen Hurts, but when you lose 32 to 9 and you're paying astronomical numbers and you're getting that type of performance, any fan base would be a little bit worried about that. So I think you have to at least consider it for Baker Mayfield. It's something to keep in mind. However, I think the, the saving grace... Maybe it's not that dramatic, but the the thing that you can kind of calm yourself down as if you're a Bucks fan is, yes, it's three years, $100 million, and you see that, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Only the first two years are guaranteed. So whatever happens with Baker this year, if it's great, it's like, wow, they got Baker for two more seasons after that. And if it's bad, you go, oh, all right, well, he had one good season, one bad season. What are we going to see from Baker next year? And if he's bad again, then the Bucs will just release it. So I think there is that kind of calming thought process behind it. Yeah, I agree. And with all the quarterbacks that you mentioned, I want to throw one more out there. Another right. former number one overall pick, Jared Goff. After he got traded to the Lions, there was so much talk about whether he could be that franchise quarterback or if he was just going to be the bridge starting quarterback 
for the Lions before they found that guy. Yeah. And Jared Goff, after coming to Detroit, he really established himself and he kind of got his career back on track. So I can kind of see Baker taking the Jared Goff route where if he plays the next season or two at a really high level, maybe elevates his game just a little bit, there could be talk of, of keeping him in Tampa yeah. on another contract. And I thought it was interesting today, though, uh, Joel Glazer, he was asked about if Baker is a franchise quarterback. And then he's kind of like, it depends how you define it. Uh, in his mind, when he looks at a franchise quarterback, it's a guy that wins games and can be that leader and difference maker. At times last season, Baker showed it. But can he do it the whole season, I think, is going to be the deciding factor. Yeah, very much so. We got another super chat from uh, thanks to Scotty J for this dollar ninety nine super chat. It says, "Been a Buck fan since the Leroy days," uh, and then asks, "Wide receiver stops from Oklahoma late rounds." Uh, appreciate the comment. I'm not gonna lie; I have not dove too much into um, this Oklahoma wide receiver. So I would just say for the Bucks, they've done. The late round thing with wide receivers again. Devin Tompkins, undrafted free agent. Jalen Darden was, I think, a fourth or fifth rounder. Trey Palmer obviously was a sixth rounder last year. Rakeem Jarrett, undrafted free agent. They've gone the route of late round. Scotty Miller, which obviously that worked to the best ability of the Buccaneers. Yeah. Scotty Miller was a late round pick. They've done this time and time again. It's been a while since they really, really since Chris Godwin, who was a third round pick. It's been a while since they went after a wide receiver. And understandably so, when you have Mike and Chris, there's not really a need to draft yeah. a wide receiver early. However, I think that's the best path of direction um, for the Bucks. Also, shout out to Intrinsic, who says, Intrinsic, who says, one of the best decisions I made as a kid, I love the Bucks. You must be not one of these like sixty-five-year-old Bucks fans, which hey, age is just a number. Nothing you can really do about that. Um, but the Bucks' success has been in the last like four years, so I don't know. Maybe you hit the timing right, and like <laughs> you won. You skipped the, the whole dark you won time the era. first Super Bowl with the Bucks, and then uh, came back on board. But anyway, uh, thanks for the comment. Appreciate you guys. Um, Let's get to a couple more videos, shall we? Jordan Whitehead, new addition to the Buccaneers. Todd Bowles spoke about his fit, how much better this defense will be with Jordan Whitehead on the team. And then also, I asked him about what Tavier Thomas and uh, Bryce Hall will bring to the Buccaneers and rounding out that cornerback room. This is what he had to say. We'll have a lot more communication. You know, Jordan was great when he was here before. He was a great communicator and leader for us when he was on the field. Him and Levante clicked a couple of years ago, and I'm sure Levante is one of the happiest guys to have him back. I'm happy to have him back. And Winfield, the whole team is happy to have him back in the fold. And just look forward to with the experience that he's gotten in New York to help us get better on the back end. Todd, what can you tell us about the two new cornerback signings and how they fit on this team and round out the quarterback room? Bryce Hall is a very good football player. Uh, he's an outside corner, highly intelligent, very long. He's very long, just like Zion and Dean is. Uh, plays great man-to-man, -man, has a good feel for zone. Uh, he had some injury issues in the, in the past, but we can keep him healthy. I think he'll be a good addition for us. Tommy Ayer plays nickel as well as special teams. Uh, he's a fierce tackler. He's a tough competitor. And he can play some safety for us as well. He, he's a really good utility piece to use. And he's a chess piece going forward to see how much he learns that we can really use to help us during the season. Uh, Jason, also, Jason, we'll get to Jason Light in a second. Todd also had uh, some very interesting comments about actually we got another Jordan Whitehead video we'll play that first I thought he matured I thought, I thought his hands were extremely well worked well with the Jets I think he's 
played back deep a lot better and the other stood quarters and have coverage where we use them more around the line of scrimmage. We use them back some. I think he became a very good third down player. Uh, and he was still young when we had him and he matured a lot over the years. So all of that we expect to see when we get out on the field. I can't been think back that far, but those are probably the two quickest ones I've coached. But I have coached one or two. I don't think at the same time. They have a good feel on the field of what each other's going to do. They, they, like I said, they both communicate, and that communication on defense for us is everything. If you have one in the back end, one in the middle, and one in the front, which we have all three now. I don't know if we had that last year. I thought Wim was communicative, but Jordan was like vocal, vocal. Obviously, he had more years on him at the time. Uh, him and Lamonte just clicked and were always on the same page, so just look forward to rekindle that and pick that up and just be more communicative on the back end. So Balls is talking a little bit about the the combo of Jordan Whitehead and, of course, Antoine Winfield Jr. as well. Uh, but Adam, Todd had some interesting comments about K.J. Britt, his comfort level of K.J. as a starter, and kind of like interweave Devin White. He was asked about Devin White going to the Eagles, interweave Devin into that conversation as well. What did you think about his, his answer? It was kind of like... Uh, a subtle shot at Devin White when he mentioned like KJ Britt doesn't have to run the 40 kind of alluding to Devin White and his blazing speed, but how KJ Britt, he plays the game fast while he doesn't run fast and kind of said he, uh, he isn't fast and he plays slow. So kind of talking about like the difference between Devin White and KJ Britt's play style and how KJ Britt in that regard will fit better on the Bucks defense next year. Uh, Scott Reynolds, he wrote, about K.J. Britt and if he will cover the other inside linebacker spot next season for the Bucs opposite Levante David. And based on Bull's answer, it sounds like that's the direction the the team's going to go. And with Servassier Dennis and J.J. Russell kind of waiting in the wings, inside linebacker, it feels like less of a need as the draft approaches. Get lit, K.J. Britt. Let's get to the tape. When K.J. he's he's such a enigmatic guy that he, he, he consumes everybody. Devin is also. I just thought the timing was right. He earned his playing time. He practiced like a pro every day. We look forward to him being one of our leaders this year and, you know, with Devin the best off from when he went to Philly and he knows what he has to do and he's still one of the greatest talents in this league and I wish him the best. We look forward to seeing KJ out Two steps in the speed department he makes up for being in the right place and understanding the game. So, you can play fast and not be fast, and you can be fast and not play fast. So KJ is one of those guys that not very fast, but he plays fast. So we talk about those things. KJ Britt deceptively fast. The last Todd Bowles video we'll play, and then we'll get to a little bit from Jason Light and uh, Joel Glazer. Uh, the offensive line, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion. He spoke about Luke Gedeke, and um, then about Cody Malk, especially with like. Get a key taking such a big step in year two. If that's the same expectation level for uh, Cody Malk as he goes into his second NFL season. He's got a very good year, uh, both from guard to tackle. I thought he's one of our unsung heroes right there. He didn't give up a lot of sacks. Um, he played tough. He played with confidence. He played out on the edge. He was very comfortable that way. Uh, him and Tristan working out all year. I thought he was a pleasant surprise, but just look forward to him getting better. Gedeke made a big jump from year one to year two, granted he was moving uh, out to tackle. Is that kind of a similar expectation for Cody Mouk as he goes into year two playing guard again? I think with the experience he got in year one, uh, he'll be a lot better. I thought he was very smart, played very tough last year. I think he hit a rookie wall at some point with the grind and his body. I think he knows how to prepare uh, physically right now. Uh, a little, he'll be a little more stouter, a little more heavier. He's a good football player. He's a very good football player. We look for Cody to be very, very good this year. Having a good offensive line is important for building that foundation for the rest of your offense. You want a great foundation with the home that you want to buy. And if you're going through the home buying experience, the best people to work with is Eric Gross, Eric and Caitlin Gross, uh, the official realtors of pewterreport.com takes a full team effort to win a football game and it takes a full team effort to win in real estate 
The Eric Gross Group have done hundreds of transactions in this crazy real estate market, and they have the experience in all types of situations. Eric is an avid Pewter Report reader and a Tampa native whose father was stationed at MacDill Air Force Base. He and his team have the market knowledge, top-notch communication, and commitment to excellent service that sets them apart. With their strong team of vendors and a network of 85,000 agents, the Eric Gross Group will turn your dream of buying or selling a home into a reality. Their clients are not just transa- transactions, they are lifelong friendships. So don't let the stress of buying or selling a home keep you out of the game. Let the Eric Gross Group take the pressure off. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Eric Gross Group and check out their website, housesinfla.com, or give them a call at 513 907 4271. That's housesinfla.com. 513-907-4271. No matter where you are in your home ownership journey, you'll feel welcome with the Eric Gross Group, the official realtor of pewterreport.com and the Peter Report podcast. So it's been a little bit different of an offseason for Jason Light this year compared to last year because they got more money to spend. Yeah, a lot <laughs> They have more, money. more room and flexibility for it. And Jason spoke about how he feels a lot better this offseason. Yeah, obviously I feel a lot better than I did last offseason. Just um, knowing what uh, this team's capable of and we're getting better and better as we went along during the season. Um, so it's not like we're just staying status quo. I think the players that we have are going to get better. Um, the team's going to be better. We're going to add some more youth during the draft. Um, so I'm really, really excited. And, of course, Jason Light is doing what he's doing because he was hired by the Glazer family to do so. And Joel Glazer said today, they're lucky to have Jason Light. No, Jason, time flies, but Jason does a great job. And uh, we're lucky to have Jason in all aspects of what he does. And the uh, last several years, it's drafting or free agency, cap management. Uh, Jason and his staff do a wonderful job. Great work and relationship, and he's got great organization that he's built. And that stability, I think, is, is key in this sport. It's constant change that causes all sorts of problems. And to have that stability and uh, everything Jason brings to the table, we're just, I think we're fortunate to have him. Is there something you like most? And of course, the, the big thing Jason Line in the front office has done this year or this offseason is re signing everybody. Whether it's yeah. Baker, Mike Evans, Levante David. So, Adam, you actually asked Joel Glazer about those re signings and, and what it meant to him. It was uh, very important, but not just, again, important. It was great for our organization. It's just great. Levante David, talk about Mr. Buck. I mean, that guy has been unbelievable. Unbelievable on the field. Unbelievable off the field. He cares more than Levante David. And to have him with us for so long. They have players that stay with the organization for a long time. These days with free agency, players moving around, it's, you know, it's rare, it's unique. They have multiple people in that position. So it makes it uh, even more enjoyable. Mr. Buck, Levante yeah, David. That's a great nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Buck, number 54, Levante David. Hey guys, we're going to talk more about the annual owners meeting tomorrow uh, because Todd Bowles had another statement about certain chess pieces on this team. Who are the chess pieces, particularly on the defense for the Buccaneers? So the title of tomorrow's show is Todd Bowles's chess pieces. Some players that can be moved around and have versatility and uh, all that fun stuff. And then we have another fun show to round out the week. On Thursday, it'll be Adam and myself again. We are doing a live Bucks seven-round mock draft. We've done this a couple of times over the last two seasons. Uh, we'll go on Pro Football Focus, do seven rounds, get all the input from you guys in the chat as well. We'll have everyone vote on uh, which player to pick in each round. A lot of fun. Can't wait to get all of your feedback about it. So in the meantime, if you're not already doing so, please like and subscribe to pewterreport.com. All of our social media is right there at Pewter Report on X, Facebook, and Instagram. And, of course, our YouTube channel is Pewter Report TV. So, please 
like and subscribe. Leave a comment when this video is done. Help us grow our following over at uh, Pewter Report and our YouTube channel, Pewter Report TV. So that's going to do it for us on tonight's show. Really fun one in prime time. Going to do it better again tomorrow and Thursday at 4 p.m. So until then, for Adam Slavon, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Out.